The megatooth sharks were a fearsome lineage of fish with an ancestry dating all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs, famously culminating in the massive Otodus megalodon, the largest macropredatory shark known to have ever lived. While it's clear from the huge fossil teeth of this shark that Megalodon was undoubtedly a ferocious predator that fed on large prey items, recent work has been focusing on a less obvious aspect of these fossils to determine just what these animals were preying on and how they came to dominate the food webs of the prehistoric oceans. And what they found is that Megalodon truly was the world's ultimate predator. Studies on Megalodon often seem to focus on the mystery behind its extinction, working out how strong its bite force was, or body length estimates. These are all important aspects of this fish that are interesting to study and give us a good idea about what it was like, but a fascinating approach taken by some recent analyses has been to investigate the levels of isotopes found in the teeth of these fish, which, as it turns out, can tell us a great deal about how Megalodon lived and what it hunted. Since Megalodon is a shark and therefore had a cartilaginous skeleton, body fossils of this animal are incredibly rare, and instead all we have to go on are teeth and isolated vertebrae. However, the shape and structure of teeth can of course be used to inform a lot about the diet and feeding mechanisms of an animal, and it's clear that this was certainly an apex predator. Plus, feeding traces found on the bones of marine mammals such as seals and small whales that match the teeth of Megalodon are clear indicators of the sorts of animals these sharks fed on. So what additional information can analyses of the isotope levels in these fossil shark teeth reveal? Well, a recent study by paleontologists has found a new way of measuring the nitrogen isotope composition to show whereabouts in the ancient food webs of our oceans Megalodon was positioned. Nitrogen isotopes have been utilised for a while to work out trophic positions in modern day ecosystems as well as in the very recent past, since the heavier nitrogen isotope, nitrogen-15, accumulates in relatively higher concentrations compared to nitrogen-14 the higher up the food web you go. This is due to the fact that nitrogen-14 is preferentially excreted in organisms, leading to higher relative levels of nitrogen-15. Basically, higher ratios of nitrogen-15 to nitrogen-14 indicate that the organism is feeding on other organisms higher up in the food web. The problem is, though, that nitrogen isotopes are usually measured from preserved bone collagen, and collagen doesn't often last more than 10,000 to 100,000 years and very rarely fossilises. So this method of determining the trophic level of animals has not been applied to older prehistoric creatures, until now. This study found that there's actually some nitrogen-bearing matter within the fossil teeth of Megalodon, with proteins left over from when the tooth first formed that are bound within the mineralized structure of the teeth still retaining measurable nitrogen isotopes. This is a pretty extraordinary discovery. This now means that much older organisms can have their trophic position investigated on the million year scale, at least as long as they possess enameloids, the structure that shark teeth are composed of. So then, what did the researchers find out about Megalodon's place in the ancient oceanic ecosystem? The study has some remarkable implications for this shark and its ancestors, looking all the way back to the Cretaceous period at ancient megatooth sharks, the lineage that Megalodon belongs to, and finding that at this point in time, the megatooths had similar levels of nitrogen-15 to coexisting sharks that fed on fish. Then, after the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, the megatooth shark nitrogen levels started to take off. During the Paleocene and Eocene epochs, the sharks showed a significant increase in nitrogen-15 compared to other fish-eating shark species, and then this increased level was maintained in the following Oligocene epoch. Megalodon itself then shows a very large range of nitrogen values in the Miocene and Pliocene when it lived, with an average value putting it above all coexisting fish-eating sharks, as well as significantly above the modern great white shark. This shows a few different interesting things. Firstly, the members of the Megatooth lineage were clearly feeding on prey items that had an elevated nitrogen-15 content, as these sharks' isotope content puts them above even modern marine mammals that feed on seals, such as polar bears and orcas. Secondly, that means that for a good deal of the Cenozoic era, there were potentially one to two extra steps in the food chains of the oceans than there are in our modern waters. Why is that? It's possible that the different environmental conditions near the start of the era allowed for increased productivity and therefore the evolution of megatooth sharks occupying especially high trophic positions. Thirdly though, is the fact that this increase in nitrogen-15 in Paleocene megatooth sharks happened before marine mammals evolved in the Eocene. So what were the Paleocene sharks feeding on that put them right at the top of the food webs? Well, it suggested that perhaps they were cannibalistic, feeding on smaller megatooths that themselves already had an elevated nitrogen-15 content. However, the biggest increase in nitrogen-15 did occur in the Eocene epoch, around the time of origin of marine mammals. So perhaps the Eocene megatooths then switched to feeding on early predatory whales that ate smaller whales, giving them extremely high isotope compositions. 
The fourth implication is the interesting fact that the very high trophic position of the Megatooth lineage was already achieved by the Eocene and stayed high through to the Miocene when Megalodon appeared. However, these older Megatooth sharks were a lot smaller than the big fish of death, so it seems that very large size was not actually that important in the climbing of the trophic levels. In fact, it might have been the initially high trophic position that enabled Megalodon to get so big in the first place, along with other selective factors such as the benefits of retaining body heat and the fact that Megalodon babies cannibalized each other in the uterus, giving the surviving offspring an advantageous start to life. Finally, there's also the extreme range of nitrogen-15 values found for Megalodon. While some individuals of this shark species did indeed have ridiculously high nitrogen-15 levels, there were others included in the sampling that had quite low values. So what does that mean? It suggests that Megalodon had a very generalist diet, essentially just feeding on whatever it wanted. Previous studies have found this to be the case too, and now this isotope data shows that these massive fish were equally happy to feed on other top predators, as well as small-bodied baleen whales that had a low trophic level. Interestingly, the paleontologists point out this could also suggest that the extinction of the small baleen whales might not have played as big of a part in the extinction of Megalodon as had been previously thought, since it seems they were more generalist and not specialised hunters of these cetaceans, so it was likely other factors that contributed more to their demise. But there's an interesting other very recent paper that might provide more insight into the extinction of Megalodon. This study uses an entirely new method of determining trophic levels using isotopes of the element zinc, also found in the enameloid of shark teeth and apparently preserving for a very long time. While this study also confirms that the Megatooth lineage were apex predators feeding at the top of the food chains, something interesting seems to have happened to Megalodon during the early Pliocene, towards the end of its reign. Changing levels of zinc isotopes in the teeth of Megalodon found in the Atlantic indicate a reduced trophic position in the early Pliocene compared to individuals that lived earlier, a trophic position that would actually put them lower than that of the modern Great White. However, Great White teeth from the early Pliocene were also examined, and found to have also been in an apparently lower trophic position at this time than they are today. What seems to have been happening here was that both these shark species were targeting prey lower down in the food chain, such as the small baleen whales that became highly abundant at this time and maybe also sea cows, making it seem as though Megalodon was in a lower trophic level than at earlier points in the past when it was feeding on predatory toothed whales, seals and sea lions. This could also explain the apparent relatively higher trophic position of living great whites, as they aren't targeting baleen whales as often as they did when smaller species existed in the past. The interesting implication from this study is the fact that early Pliocene Atlantic populations of Megalodon and Great Whites were seemingly overlapping in their trophic positions and therefore may have competed with each other in what they fed on. Although other factors were almost certainly at play too, the paper then suggests that competition with Great White Sharks in the Pliocene could have been another driving force behind the disappearance of Megalodon. So, it's clear from these recent studies that the use of isotopes to work out positions within food webs is an incredibly useful tool. The zinc isotope paper is particularly exciting too, as this is the first time that this element has been used in such a way, and obviously it can tell us a great deal about how ecosystems operated in deep time. Megalodon also continues to be a source of fascination and awe for paleontologists and the public alike, and studies such as these show how justified this is. This massive shark really was a ferocious predator, capable of taking almost any prey it wanted. Research into this fish is bound to carry on for many, many years to come, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we discover about it next. Nom. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed Shark Week 2022. As always, it's been so much fun learning about these animals and spreading a greater appreciation for such remarkable creatures. And if you're not quite ready for Shark Week to be over yet, then be sure to head on over to my mum's channel One World, where she's just made a video about why great white sharks are gathering in a particular place in the Pacific Ocean, as well as a video on the mystery of why so many sea otters are suddenly dying of shark bites. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters too, especially our dinosaur tier patrons, Amanda Von Nordek, Archienthus, Brent Furman, Clara Middleton, Daniel Ingraham, Dhruv Srivastava, George Vojtek, Jet Skipper, Corey Peterson, Loxy Poo, Mike Pace, Nicole Bueno, Persian Boy, Robert Thomas, and Steve Bradshaw. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.